ready for the word this morning? Wow. restaurant and God has a meal for us as he's moving through you. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, Lord, we're hungry. May I be your holy chef this morning. We had a great time last night. I invited uh, our journey group leaders and pastors and elders out to the house last night. We had 20 something people and it was great, especially because Jack and Pat brought me a lemon pie. (laughs) And I only ate half of it, but the other half is calling me. I can hear the voice from the (laughs) the refrigerator, come eat me, come eat me. And uh, poor lemon pie is gonna get devoured today. And I, I'm praying that uh, we get devoured also. Yes. Amen. How many would like to be devoured by the Lord? Yes. Amen. Actually, that's the wrong thing. The Lord wants us to devour his word. Yes. So we need to eat the word because in the word is life. Amen. I so appreciate the anointing of the Holy Spirit um, lately, it's been kind of neat because I've been going in and out of that presence more than in recent days. And I caught myself this morning in the bathroom listening to an old Andre Crouch song. And uh, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. And man, I just started crying because the presence of the Lord came. And uh, I I told the Lord, I said, I I really hope that you come that way this morning in the church. Something about the presence that changes everything in our life. I was driving up the driveway this morning also and the same presence came upon me. And I was listening to my tribute. (laughs) How can I say thanks for the things that you've done for me? And after over 30 years of driving up this driveway, I never fail to appreciate the joy it is to come to the house of God. You know, there's very few things in life that, other than lemon pie, (laughs) that perpetually supply you with an endless stream of joy, (laughs) except the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. There's life evermore in the presence of the Lord. It's amazing how that all of our concerns and ponderings and questions are answered just by one touch from the Lord. It just makes you appreciate so much. You know, I I would have given up on this a long time ago if I had to walk simply by doctrine or religious expression. But how can you give up on the presence? And just at my lowest moments, I'm sure you relate to this, at your lowest moment, the Lord comes. In your greatest weaknesses, his strength is revealed. There's something about that glory. Look in 1 Peter chapter four, and I'm I'm praying the Lord will just unlock this today for us. I don't know if this message will wind up in the most bombastic place that it wound up in last week because I was preaching on the Word of God, and we called it the Burning Word. Believe me, that was better than the first title that I chose, Hunka Hunka Burning Word. (laughs) I, I really maybe should have stuck with that. More people would probably listen to it. 
So everybody say, honka, honka, burning word. <laughs> the word comes like a fire, consuming the things in front of it. How many know that fire is a good thing? We got all those fires in California right now, and we pray for the people's safety and the things that could be destroyed that God would spare. But at the same time, fire is a good thing because only, only out of the fire comes something new, something pure. So the Lord said in Peter, and that's not the scripture I'm reading this morning, but don't get concerned about when you fall into a fiery trial because it's going to serve a purpose for your life. And looking back over life, I, I've got so many fiery trials that I've been through, they're too numerous to count. But you know, I don't re remember those with a, a tragic thought of like, well, oh God, I went through that. I, I remember it as the birthing of something new in my life. The, the testing of my faith is more precious than gold and silver. Results in praise to the Lord. First Peter chapter four, uh, beginning with verse 10, as each one has received a gift. How many here have received gifts? How many believe that you have a gift from God? Raise your hand. Now, you may not be aware of it, but every one of you here has been bestowed gifts from the Lord. In fact, all good gifts come down from heaven. So everything that we do, we minister as a gift from God. In other words, it doesn't, the origin of the gift doesn't originate with us, but it originates with the giver. And so when God gives a gift, it carries his nature, his power, his anointing on it. It's not something we have to produce because it's produced for us. Minister to one another as good stirs of the manifold grace of God. One of the things about gifts is that they always should be accompanied by the grace of God. You're giving gifts, you're ministering to one another by the grace of God. In other words, God's favor is in the midst of everything that you do. Because you, you want to leave an impression, not of yourself, not of your ability or your talent, but the impression you leave is the impression of his nature that you give to someone else. If you only remember me by what I can give you, unfortunately, that'll be a, a short-term memory. But if there's something that I can part to you from the Lord, that stays with you forever. So God, what you've given to us, let us give. For if anyone speaks in verse 11, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. Then he goes on to talk about, don't think it strange brethren when fiery trials come upon you. Amen. So the concept of ministry in the New Testament is not for the anointing of God to come upon human ability. It's anointing that comes from God that allows you to minister directly from God to people. See, we're standing as stirs of the mystery. We're standing as the recipients of the gift. So when God gives that to us, it's for the purpose of allowing him to be revealed through us, his grace to be ministered through us so that th those that are recipients of what we give bring glory to him. It's, it's been a little challenging in our growth in maturity. You see, maturity is something that we just don't step into automatically. Maturity is a process. How many have ever seen a baby that was born and it's mature its first week? No, a baby takes 
some time to mature. Now we enjoy the children when they're not mature. In fact, it's fun to play with immaturity. <laughs> I, I would feel funny playing with Finley, Finley if she was mature. <laughs> But she's a little child, so we had her up this morning. Hey, Stuart, bless you. Good to see you. Looking good. That's what your wife told me anyway. She said you were looking good. Yeah. Finley was crawling underneath the pulpit. She's right in under this glass. And I, I discourage that, really, for children doing that. Cause, because not only do they smudge the glass, but they may get hurt. Because this is kind of kind of a sharp thing, you know, and it moves up and down. And so she kept going back and forth, but I couldn't, I didn't have the heart to make her quit. <laughs> So I, I put my hand there to protect her while she was crawling so she wouldn't get hurt. But I, I love playing with children. I really do. Amen? Because there's something of innocence in their spirit. But God wants to bring us to maturity. And the more mature we get, the more responsible we get with what God gives us. The more stewardship we take on ourselves to hold dear the thing that God has imparted to us because we must take it seriously. If God has given us something, he's given us grace, he's given us forgiveness, but he's also given us gifts. He's given us the ability to speak as an oracle. Everybody say, I am an oracle of God. And we, we come to this place that what really counts in our ministry is that which people receive of God through us. Not how impressive they are with our personality. Or, you know, personality doesn't qualify you to be an effective minister, right? In the world, it's the people that are the smartest, maybe the most handsome, the tallest, the ones that have the greatest personalities that the world tends to brand with success, right? But in the kingdom, it's just the opposite because God will take the base things of the world. He'll take the dumb things even. He took me. He'll take someone from Mule Shoe. He'll take, he'll take the least of these, my brethren. Those that will surrender themselves to the Lord, then he can reveal himself through them. So I'm very thankful today that it's not dependent upon my talent, my charisma, my personality, my ability, but my ability comes from the Lord. That when I speak, I don't have to speak under my own authority, make my own declaration, but I can speak as an oracle of God. I can speak as a per, pure representation of who he is. And Bill was talking about that connection, that lining up, and we speak a lot of that here, that we're lining ourselves up with the Father. That everything that Christ came to do was to bring us into alignment. He came to, to bring us into unity with the Father. So that, that the voice that we hear comes from Him. The heart that we have is imparted by who He is. The motivations that we go through is the motivation that God Himself has. Thus, we become a representation of someone besides ourselves. See, but because apart from him, I'm nothing. Apart from him, I can do nothing that's substantial or that has lasting imprint. But, it's, but with my, that connection that I have with him, I can stand in his stead. I can stand as his representative. I can stand as his minister, one that's endowed with his gifts anointed with his presence so that those that see me can see who he is, thus bringing glory and honor to the one who's called me. Amen? So if any man speaks, let him speak as an oracle of God. God wants a revelation of himself to come through you. You house, everybody say, I'm a house for the Lord to live in. For it said, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God lives in his temple. He's chosen that place to abide. So I am in the house. Everybody said again, I'm the house that the Lord lives in. As confusing as that may seem because we know who we are. 
God chose to live in imperfect vessels. Aren't you glad that David was the greatest example that we can follow because doesn't he just kind of fit the bill the way we act? Hopefully most of us aren't as bad as David. He committed some very grievous sins, but yet God chose to live in the heart of David because in David's heart, he didn't seek his own glory. He only sought to bring glory to the Lord who loved him. Consequently, that purity that was in his spirit becomes like a shining star that everyone can be drawn to. He said, this is the kingdom that I'll build myself upon, this kingdom of the heart of David. The place that, the one that cried out in the book of Psalms, Lord, let you find a place to dwell in me. Like the little sparrow that would go and dwell in the rafters. Let, let my heart be like that, that you dwell within me, Lord. Let my heart be purified. Search me, O oh God. Cleanse me. Try me. See if there be any wicked way within me. O oh God, even the bones that thou hast broken, let them receive your joy. Let your presence never depart from me, Lord. That was his cry and his heart that God may be revealed in the house, this tent that he had. And that's our prayer in this church, Lord. We don't want just a church. We don't want just an organization. We just don't want another place where we go and have some religious exercise. But Lord, we want you to abide in the midst of us so that everything that emanates from this place is a reflection of the purity of your heart and of your motivation. Apostle Paul, remember he said in 1 Corinthians chapter two, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, but I came proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of men's wisdom. Isn't it interesting in the context of the society that we live in today that we're seeking to perfect our speech and our presentation at the exclusion of his presence. We, we live in a golden age of teachers, philosophers, one-liners. And thus, that, but that doesn't produce his presence. We live in a golden age where man is being taught to be strong in his own abilities and his own assets. And God says, become weak. Right. Just the opposite of what the Lord would speak. Paul said, hey, I didn't come with any superiority of speech or of excellence or of any wisdom, but I came in one thing, demonstration of his spirit, his power within me. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. Why? So that your faith should not rest upon the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. My prayer this morning for all of us, when we finally make our dismissal, that we walk out and say, hey, his presence touched me today. Hmm? Yeah. How many like that? Wow. It's not how clever we can preach or how we can, home and we can exegesis the scripture because a sermon is just a sermon until God puts a word in a man to speak it. Because that which can be created in the mind falls flat, but that which is created in the heart brings life. So God created in our hearts the purity of the relationship that we have with you. So that we may become like that which says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe 2 Corinthians, that we're becoming the living epistles, living epistles, read and known of all men. That God yourself has etched upon our hearts your word. 
Just like Jesus was the Word and the Word was with God, we too are the Word. You know, God wants to bring forth a people in this hour that become the Word. Living epistles. Demonstration of God himself. Wow. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for touching us today. Amen. Wow. Man, I love this. How many love it? Everybody say, I love it. Lord, let the, that famine that's been in the land for the hearing of the word, let there be, Lord, an outpouring of your spirit that the word may prosper once again in the midst of us. Let there be, Lord, the willingness in our heart that we're not resistance, resistant to the change that you want to bring to us. Lord, let, it, let us be submissive to the process of maturing our hearts Lord, we, we yield voluntarily, Father, to the, to the cross and to the, 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 the word of God that comes like a sharp two-edged sword that, the very, that divides the very joint and the marrow and the very intents of our heart. Lord, let us be purified by the thing that you speak. For he said, but the words that are spoken will cleanse you. The washing of the water of the word of God. Hallelujah. So Lord, let's take a bath in the word. <laughs> Woo! Splash some word on me, Lord. Let the word come and, and divide to the very joint and the marrow, the very intents of my own heart. Lord, if there's any deception in me, Lord, or anything that would hold on to that which was and won't embrace that which is to come, Lord, let it be revealed in this hour. So that you may find a house to dwell in, a place of abiding within me. Whew. Drive down the road today and tomorrow and the rest of this week and just visualize you're being clothed from on high with this new dwelling. Just go down the road and feel the energy power of the Holy Spirit coming all over you and in you and out through you and through you and just go down the road and open your mouth and say, hey, I have the word of the Lord within my mouth and speak to the things that need to be spoken to, bind the things that need to be bound, loose the things that need to be loosed, declare the things that need to be declared. Let this word dwell richly within you and let it run swiftly out of you. My, my. First Thessalonians. Whew. Lord. My, my, my. Where's it at? Okay, there we go. Sometimes you get a little tipsy when you stand up here and you have a trouble remembering where the scripture is. Tipsy people have trouble. Okay, First, first Thessalonians chapter one, verse two. We give thanks to God always for all, making mention you in our prayers. Well, you know, I've been reading so much lately in the epistles. Paul had a challenging time. <laughs> you realize how challenging it was for him to walk with God? Man, I'm thinking, we got the easy street. <laughs> he paid a price. Jesus paid a price, but Paul paid a price. And, and just even a little, a, a little identification with Christ and the suffering. You know, Paul said, I'm suffering with him so that I may reign with him. Man, just a tiny bit of the suffering of Christ is about all I can stand. Wow. And a little suffering goes a long ways to bring in a lot of glorification. And Paul so jumped into the spirit of Christ that he was so engrossed in it that he went through things that are almost unspeakable. The suffering that he, Paul went through. So, you know, if your Christianity is being a little challenged, believe me, someone else has had a greater challenge than you and you can find him right in the epistles. Man, 
Every time I begin to feel sorry for myself, all I got to do is read Isaiah 53. Here was a man acquainted with grief and sorrow. And it was all that so that he could give me all this. Thank you, Jesus. Man, we give thanks to God always for the, you making mention of our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Knowing beloved brethren, your election by God. Hallelujah. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, but with much joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's amazing how the, in the midst of the affliction comes the joy. In the midst of the greatest challenges in your life, don't bemoan the challenge, accept the challenge, knowing that this, that what you're going through now is giving away to something greater. Amen. Everybody say, there's a greater promise for me than the present affliction that I endure. There may be, you know, the Psalm says there's weeping at midnight, but joy cometh in the morning. Hallelujah. So whatever we go through, oh, we count it as joy, knowing that the, what God is working us is so incredible that there's not words to describe it. So you received this word, he said, in much affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit. So you became examples, everybody say, and an example to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. They should, that's a car name, isn't it? For, for we got one of those. For from you, the word of God has sounded forth not only in Macedonia, but in Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Wow. See, God is releasing the word that in the midst of affliction, in the midst of trial, much joy came upon them. They pursued God and the word of the Lord began to sound forth from the midst of those people. See, this early church, you've got to realize, was birthed in the midst of total darkness. There was no, no reflection of God being revealed until it was revealed through those that brought the gospel. All of a sudden, bang, the light came on. And the moment that it did, it began to brew and begin to mature in the hearts of the believers until one day here it began to sound forth from them. This mighty roar, this mighty word began to come out of the church to change the world. These are those that have turned the world upside down. Hallelujah. The Lord is going to multiply in this hour. Verse 13, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Amen. John chapter six. Go there with me if you would just for a moment, work with me just for a second because I want, there's something I want you to hear in this. John chapter six, and we're, we're not gonna read the whole chapter, we're gonna begin in verse 67 in a moment. But you remember it starts out with Christ feeding the 5,000 people. Great multitude followed him because they were following the signs which he performed on those who were diseased. So he brought him up to the mountain and he sat down with the disciples and the Passover came and he saw that there was a great multitude, but they had no bread to eat. So the Lord multiplied the barley loaves and two small fish so that the whole crowd could be fed. A great miracle, wasn't it? They brought the fragments and brought all the things that had been, been eaten and brought together and they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets, it says 
in verse 13. And then it said that from that point, Christ went out and walked on the water. In verse 17, he got in the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. It was so neat when we were there on the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum, it was on this one side. And so we're out in this boat and I'm looking and that scripture came to mind about the Lord and how he was on one side and the sea rose up and they rode and, and the storm came and he said, don't be afraid of the storm. And uh, they, they brought him onto the boat as Christ was walking on the water and we were there at that very place. What an incredible experience. But it brought home that what he began to say next that he said, I am the bread of life. This thing that, 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 this thing that I am, this person that I am, I've come down from heaven for a purpose and that was to give you bread, to give you life and substance. This morning, we received the life and the substance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like we, we took communion last night. We take this bread and we eat it. We, we had communion this morning. So the bread comes into our body. It becomes the substance of our life. That we know that everything that we are is because has, God has intended to create it in us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So he goes on and, and he, it, in this chapter, he, he begins, he's teaching them and uh, verse 43, don't murmur among yourselves, chapter six. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. How many know that what you get is what God gives you by revelation? Everybody say, we need revelation. Ask, let's ask the Lord right now. Lord, give us a revelation of who you are. Let us understand your nature, Lord, by revelation. Lord, let us understand what connection is, what unity is by revelation. It's not something we come and just agree to have, but it's something we must receive by the Spirit. Amen? The Word comes, but the Spirit comes with the Word to reveal the Word to us. That's called revelation. Revelation is the revealed Word of God. Everybody say the revealed word of God. So he's praying, Lord, let them see who I am. Let them know who you are. As is written in verse 45, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. But this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So the Jews quarreled and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? One of the things that touched me so about Paul was in a scripture, I'm trying to think where that scripture, but he said, I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you who I am. And I, and I realize that the beauty of Christ coming to give us this wonderful life, but then once we receive it, how he takes your life and does the same function to give so that they, everyone may know who the Father is. See, I can only reveal the Father to you if I'm willing to pour my life into you. Someone can only know the highest level of God dependent upon the gift that's given to them to receive it. You, can no, you cannot exceed the value of the gift that's given. So if, if I want to see something happen in you, believe God for you, or 
contending for you, then I have to be to you the very essence of who I am. Because I have to be just like Jesus. Wow. Well, Jesus came and gave the very best of who he was to claim us. Now we as his disciples, we become just like him. We begin to give our flesh. We give our blood. You know what I'm saying? Don't get bent out of shape over that. We're not gonna, we don't have a royal cross set up in the backyard that we're gonna put you on. Maybe one or two. Um, <laughs> years ago, a friend of ours that used to be a member came in and I just read this book called The Frenzied Snake Handlers. <laughs> and it was about the snake handlers in Tennessee <laughs> or Kentucky, one of those two, pretty close to the same thing. <laughs> and these guys would pick up these snakes and they'd drink strychnine. And it was a pretty interesting book. I think I've still got it in my library if you'd like to borrow it. So I was preaching about that, not about that, I was just brought that up, joking. And so they, this person thought that we kept a bucket of snakes up there where the baptistry is. Scared them to death. But I was gonna get up there and start throwing snakes in the congregation. Well, all I can throw in this congregation this morning is holy glory bombs. Amen. Hallelujah. So what we're giving you is not a bunch of poisonous snakes. We're giving you the true bread that comes down from heaven. As the living father, verse 57, sent me and I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the man and are dead, but he who eats this bread will live forever. He, so he said these in the synagogues as he taught in Capernaum. And we went to those synagogues. Some of them are still there, the remnants of synagogues where Jesus taught this very word. Amen? Wow. I was like a kid when I think about that. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard, they said, this is a hard saying. You know, when, when we start bringing the kingdom out and we talk about this identification process, about this unity thing, where we're lining ourselves perfectly up with the Father in heaven through the Son, Jesus Christ, and how we're not only aligned up heavenly, but we're aligned up uh, uh, horizontally as well, one with another. When we start preaching this, it becomes hard because it's easy to accept a gospel that is somewhere out there, but when the gospel becomes in here, it becomes the greatest challenge because now all of a sudden we have the responsibility of not only receiving this great grace and this salvation and this anointing that comes from God, but now we have the responsibility to take that and let it sound forth out of us as well, that we become the example of the Father just as Jesus was the example. So that means we've got to strip away all the religion, all the self edifying, all the ego, all the, the thing that we, that we try to create a personal, a persona around ourselves of our, of who we are. And we get stripped down so that nothing can be revealed but him. Wow. Look, Lord, I'm naked. I have nothing of myself. If I don't have you, I'm just a naked man. But Lord, you're gonna to have to clothe me with your robes of righteousness. You're gonna to have to anoint me, Lord, with your presence. Because if I don't have you, what a failure I am. So he's telling them, hey, if you want this thing, now you've seen me feed the thousands. You've seen me deliver the demons. You've seen me heal the sick. But now if you want the kingdom, 
take and eat, drink, become like me. Whole different ball game. It's not hard to get a people to follow signs and wonders and miracles because that's what everyone wants is a sign, a wonder and a miracle. Don't you? There's nothing wrong with wanting those things, but do you really want him becomes the question. Do you really want to drink the cup and eat the flesh? Are you willing to really let yourself die to your own will? Not easy to get rid of your own will. Your own will is who you are. Your own will is what constitutes how you think, what you desire, what you long for. It's your will after all. So to say, hey, if you want this, you're gonna have to take on the will of something greater than yourself. Don't want to. This is too hard for me. So you know what it said? This is so hard, nobody can understand it. I have people telling me sometimes, because I've been preaching this stuff for 40 years, I don't make any sense of what you're saying. I'm gonna go somewhere where that I can understand what the preacher's talking about. In other words, I'm gonna go somewhere where the t- preacher tells me everything I want to hear. So there's no resistance whatsoever from my will but everything that I desire comes true. I'm gonna go to find that preacher that promises to feed me and bless me and heal me. And all you're telling me is I've gotta drink a cup and eat some flesh and I don't have an appetite for it. Sorry, out of here, bye. Woo, glory to God. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? How the human nature resists the nature of God how we resist living in the palace and in the glory that where the Lord is, we resist that and we insist upon living separate from him because all we want from him is an occasional blessing. So it's hard saying. Man, there was a lot of murmuring and complaining going on. I mean, this was a church split. There, there's nothing that splits a church quicker than putting Jesus in the middle of the house. Well, when Jesus comes, we'll just have all these people. When that Jesus comes, he'll come with a sword and fire and he'll purify the sons of Levi and he'll examine the hearts of men and women. He'll pull everything in your life out and stick it right in front of you. Now look there, that's what you are. Yuck. When the glory came in Lubbock back in 73 in such profound manifestation, some of you say, well, pastor, we want that glory. Are you sure? I went through seven years of hell on earth in my own heart. Not that God still didn't bless me, still didn't use me, still worked with us. Everything looked good on the outside, but believe me on the inside, I was going through a a mechanic special. God was rearranging everything about me. The diets that I would scream and holler, caught in the vice grip of his presence. And that glory time came the glory was so strong if you came into the church with, when no one was there, it just it wasn't a normal service. You, you, people would walk in the back door and they never made it to the front. Six feet in, you would crawl. Halfway down, you would stop. And all, all you could hear was this loud, deep moaning, excruciating pain. When the weight of glory comes, it feels like it's pressing you into the floor. It's like the wine press is purifying you. Do you want the glory? Or do you just want the signs and wonders? When the real glory comes, do you really want that? Or you would say, this is too hard. We don't want 
to be hard. We want to be blessed. Hmm. Do you, know, I, do you know in 47 years, and it's kind of neat getting a little older because then you can always say in 47 years, I've, uh, I have not met one person yet that has survived that all they sought was blessing. They'll only survive for a season. Maybe it's a few months, maybe it's six months, maybe it's two or three years, maybe it's five, maybe it's 10 years, but none ever make the long haul when all they care about is how much God blesses them. But when they have a heart that says, Lord, I want to bless you, but come, I want to be a living sacrifice to you. That which you've given me, Lord, let me give back to you. Lord, here's my flesh. Here's my essence of my life. I give to you. When that's in the heart that's in you, it puts something in you that can never be taken away from you this bond that God puts in your spirit. So Jesus says, does this offend you? Have you be offended by the words that I've spoken to you? What then should you see, verse 62, the son of man ascend where he was before? For it's the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, there's that word again, are spirit and they are life. Wow. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who do not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. And you read Paul's writings and I was brought to tears last night when I read about the brethren that had turned away, that had forsaken the true gospel and followed their own path. And Paul said, they've all left There's no one left. The Lord spoke to me in 1989 when I was going through the deep darkest period, one of the deep darkest period of my soul. He spoke to me so clearly in the bedroom of our home out by Dripping Springs. He said, unless I build the house, you're gonna labor in vain. He said, I want you to preach the kingdom. Well, what's the kingdom? the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to preach the kingdom. He said, the day may come that they'll all leave you. That's what the Lord said. They may all leave you, but keep preaching and I'll raise up a mighty army. The Lord showed me not too long after that, there was 25,000 people in the city of Austin. There's probably more than that now that had a heart for the kingdom. There's people all around you that have a heart for the kingdom. They just don't know it yet. Or they haven't heard it yet because all they've been hearing is something that's really not the true gospel. They've been hearing the gospel that's been presented to them without the connection to the father or most importantly, the connection to the son. The ones that are willing to take the cup, eat the flesh. So this is a hard saying. Are you gonna leave also? Mickey's not here this morning. He'll tell you I told him this. He's up in San Angelo seeing his mother. Mickey's been coming the last three weeks and sits on the front row. So if you're gonna come sit on the front row with me, I'm gonna put your feet in the fire. So I turned to Mickey, I said, how long are you gonna walk with me? Huh? I said, yeah, how long are you going to walk with me? Are you a flash in the pan? Are you here for a season? I just want to know. Are you here? How long are you with me? Well, brother, I'm with you. I said, okay, get ready. There's some fire coming your way. There's some challenge coming your way. You want to get close? 
That's what Jesus said. Hey, you want to really walk with me? Come on. Here, eat my flesh. Drink my blood. Let's see how much you want now. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> okay. You're pushing the boundary line, Jesus. We thought you were this great savior that's come down from heaven to give us all these blessings. And now you're telling us we got to get serious. You know, please give me a break. All right, get out of here, he said. Come on, you guys that are still with me. Let's go on. Because the Father has spoken to your heart. You heard from God what he said. Amen. And I'm praying this morning in my heart. I don't know about you, but I'm praying, Lord, let this revelation be so real in me that there's no chance that I ever pull back from knowing you. That I know you. Like Paul, I want to know you. And I want to know the power of your resurrection in my life. I want to understand this connection with the Father and what it creates in me to become that just as he was the first of begotten among many sons to come to glory, I am also a son of God. Amen. That's not being sacrilegious, is it? He said, you are my sons and PC, daughters of the Lord. You have to say that in modern deals. One day we don't have to say that. We are your sons, Lord. How long will you walk with me? Okay. <laughs> it, took, it took the front row there. <laughs> Scott, I love Scott, don't you? He's awesome. Woo. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow. I, I was telling them last night, I'll never leave you. And, I, and I'm saying this by grace and by faith, right? I'm not arrogant in saying it, but I'll never leave you. Now, you might run me off, but I'm not going to leave voluntarily. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always to the end of the earth. That's not bragging, is it? It's just simply stating a fact. If I'm eating every day of this bread and drinking of this blood, then I am part of this. It's part of me. He's there and he's here and I'm here and I'm there. We're one together in the Lord. Nothing can ever separate. You know, when you become one, you become one, it's impossible to be divided. You need to be so planted and so one in your spirit with the Lord and with one another, another. Nothing will ever divide you. Nothing will ever come between you. It's nothing about, it's nothing conditional about this at all. It's, it's not something where you set a condition on how long you're committed to the Lord and to one another. Once you're in, you're in. That's all there is to it. Settle the matter. Well, if God doesn't come through quick, then I'm just going to back away. I'm going to flake away. I'm going to flake out. Oh, I'm so disappointed in the church. I'm so disappointed in the preacher. So I'm going to take my toys and go home. <laughs> Bye. You never were committed to start with. You can't tell me you're really committed and all of a sudden the next day you're not committed. You're either in or you're out. Amen. You're either a part of it or you're not a part of it. He said, if you really knew who I was, you'll never be able to get away from this. Wow. That wasn't hard, was it? <laughs> Hallelujah. Lordy, I feel strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I declare to you today that you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a new generation that God is birthing upon the earth. You are a peculiar people. Amen. And I say that with emphasis. You are a peculiar people chosen by God for this hour 
to be oracles of the living God, to be demonstrators of the nature and the purpose of God to the earth. You are a people of covenant that cannot be shaken loose. You cannot be separated from the love of God. Angels, nor principalities, nor anything from heaven, nor anything from below can separate you from this love that God has put into your spirit. You are forever bonded into the kingdom of God. You are a people chosen by God to be the living epistles from the most high Lord, Lord God, because the law that was written upon stones, even though it was glorious, the most glorious, the most glorious, the most glorious document is the word that God is writing upon your hearts to make you the living epistles, the oracles of the most high God. I release you in the name of Jesus. I release you into the boldness and the fire into your spirit that you will not keep your mouth silent, but you will declare the kingdom of God upon the earth without reservation or hesitation in the name of the Lord. You are free from the bondages and the limitations of the old order and the religious system. I blow that apart in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. And all you that are on live stream, get up off thy couch and thy bed and declare the victory of the Lord over your domicile. (laughs) Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory.